our vision for the world is a world beyond borders. That doesn't mean a world without borders. We're not trying to destroy the borders be between countries or anything like that in a physical sense, but rather the borders that we create in our own heads, like the prejudices, the stereotypes that we make about people from other countries, the judgments that we have, which often we have these just because of how we were raised, hearing things about people from other countries are like this and so on. And more than ever nowadays, the world's becoming more and more polarized. So part of our, our vision here at Real Life English, and one of the things that we really wanna help you all to do is to be a part of the solution. So in, instead of being part of polarizing the world, you know, insulting people on Twitter or being angry at your neighbor because they're from a different political party than you, really empathizing, being able to understand someone else's point of view before really judging it. Ah, uh, yeah, citizens of the world. This is Ethan from Real Life English, where every single week it is our mission to help take you beyond the classroom to speak English confidently and naturally, connect to the world, and actually use your English as the doorway to living your biggest dreams. I'm joined here in the global studio by the Lemony Ukrainian English coach, Ksenia. How's it going, Ksenia? Hi. Lemony, how sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know what it means. Is that besides that it's lemon, it's fruit, but I'm doing fine. It's a great day we're having here today. Yeah, what would it mean if you were having, let's say, some lemony pie? It's like with lemon pie was like, but not with lemon, but with this peel, lemon peels, mm -hmm. right? Like for aroma, to add some aroma. Yeah, might say like zesty as well, because the right. outside of the lemon's called zest. Uh, mm -hmm. But because I said you're lemony as a person, it's because you have a bright personality and also because you're like someone who pulls off wearing yellow really well. I haven't met many people <laughs> who like look really good in yellow. And I remember when we were together at the summit, like you have many yellow outfits and it really yeah. reflects your personality well. Thank you. I really like the color. It's like so sunshiny and so bright and you mm -hmm. know, reminds of summer. <laughs> like the and color. You're not wearing yellow today, but uh, we could say maybe today I'm a bit rosy because of the colors that I'm wearing. That's so great. So today we are beyond talking about colors. That's really fun, actually, though, that you can turn <laughs> fruits and flowers and so to describe personalities, to describe flavors and so on. But today we're talking about something that is near and dear to our hearts here at Real Life English. So you might be asking yourself, how can you be a part of the solution? And actually we took some inspiration because Ksenia in a meeting we had this week shared a really beautiful quote with us. And we thought that it would make for a perfect episode for you all. So without any further ado, I'm gonna let Ksenia go ahead and do the honors of reading that quote. Yeah, thank you, Ethan. Um, but before I read it, I think from your description, listeners and viewers understood what the word polarized is, right? It's just like mm. divided. Even more than divided, I'd say even goes beyond that because it's like when you have two magnets and you have the opposite sides, they're polarized. They, you put, try to put them together and they repel, right? So polarization is almost like that action of becoming further and further apart. Um, so let me read the quote now. Um, in polarized discussions, a common piece of advice is to take the other side's perspective. In theory, putting ourselves in another person's shoes enables us to walk in lockstep with them. In practice, though, it's not that simple. Perspective taking consistently fails because we're terrible mind readers. We're just guessing. If we don't understand someone, we can have a eureka moment by imagining his perspective. What works is not perspective taking, but perspective seeking actually talking to people to gain insight into the nuances of their views. That's what good scientists do. Instead of drawing conclusions about people based on minimal clues, they test their hypotheses by striking up conversations. It's such an amazing quote, like such an amazing message. So something else I actually noticed, Ksenia, is that in this quote, there were many uh, interesting, more advanced expressions and collocations such as eureka moments um near the end striking up conversations for example which 
depending on the situation, these can be very valuable expressions to learn. So we're going to, if you stick around until the end, we're going to actually go through this again and explain all of these expressions. So that might also help you to understand it better. But to start out, we thought that it'd be really nice to actually discuss this. And also, I would say that if you're listening to this on the Real Life English app, uh, or if you're not yet, it's absolutely free to download. And you can find a link to that in the description, whether you're in the audio or you're on YouTube. Uh, and then you can actually study these expressions with intelligent flashcards so you never forget them. It's a really amazing technology. But Ksenia, where did this quote come from? The quote comes from the book uh, called Think Again, uh, written by Adam Grant. Nice. Adam Grant, yeah, I've heard him. I don't think I've read any books by him yet, but I've heard him on different podcasts and he's a super yeah. smart guy. He has his own podcast. It's called Rethinking. Mm-hmm. It makes sense, right, with the name of the book then? Yeah. <laughs> Rethinking, think again. Is there a big lesson that you took away from this book? Totally. Actually, there are many lessons, and I <laughs> highly recommend everyone to read this book. It's really you know, relevant to a uh, you know, modern world, to changing world. I think it's about um, being, being curious and open, uh, opening your own mind and other people's minds. Um, and also, he talks about this new concept for me. I learned it from this book. It's called um, confident humility. Mm. Uh, we know that humility means like humbleness. Yeah, when you are humble mm -hmm. um, and confident, it shows you that you doubt yourself, but in a good way. Like you uh, question the status quo, you question your assumptions, and doubt your your way of thinking. Right. So that's why the book is called like Think Again, mm. like Rethink. I really like that. Confident humility, that almost sounds like what we would call an oxymoron, which an oxymoron True. is, for example, if you say a little big dog might be like a big race of a dog. Uh, it wouldn't be race in English, sorry. A big breed of a dog. Uh, and a little one would be like a puppy of a big breed or something. But it, it's two things that seemingly don't go together or they're seemingly opposites, but they make sense. So that kind of confidence and humility, they almost seem like opposite things, right? But you put them together and it's given this really sort of beautiful sort of meaning where you're, you're open to the world and you're open to learning new things. You're open to other perspectives, right? And what motivated you to read this book in particular? I wouldn't have read it uh, if we didn't have this book chosen as the book of the month in the Flusa Circle, where every month we choose a book to read with our students. We have a small, cozy book club there. Uh, and yeah, that was a book of the month, I think two months ago. Mm, and I was so happy we chose this one exactly because uh, that was my choice. <laughs> there were a couple of more books, but yeah, I was happy that we ended up choosing this one. A book club actually is a great way to connect with people. If you love reading or if you're trying to develop a reading habit, it can give you some good accountability to read it. So even if you do that in your own language, but then if you do it in English, it also has that added effect that reading is absolutely one of the best ways to expand your vocabulary, to see grammar and context and so many more things. So yeah. uh, that sounds like a great idea. And you mentioned the fluency circle. So maybe you could just tell people in case they don't know what that is. What is the fluency circle? Yeah, fluency circle is our community of English learners. Uh, those are students from all around the world. They have this space, this place, a uh, Telegram chat group where they communicate every day, have different challenges like book club, as we mentioned already. And yeah, that's, that's an amazing, amazing place for me. And by the way, by organizing this book club, I, I kind of scratched my own itch because like mm. you mentioned, it's like a great motivation when you read a book together. It like motivates me to keep reading because I'm a terrible reader. Like, I mean, I'm a slow <laughs> reader, a reader, mm -hmm. I'm a slow reader. Uh, and I can like, you know, read books for two, three months. But because we have those deadlines, you know, one month, <laughs> one book, mm -hmm. I try to keep up with the pace. It makes and sense. And Circle is a great, you know, great motivator. You mentioned there, scratch my own itch. That's a really nice English expression. What does that mean? Uh, it means like, actually, I think I learned this phrase from some article about entrepreneurship uh, and startup businesses. It's like, usually some small businesses start like that. A person has their own needs. They, I don't know, maybe they like gardening like me. <laughs> and uh, 
by doing something what you enjoy or what you need to accomplish uh, and then you want to grow and develop that thing and it grows into your own business right so by scratching your own itch scratch means like to you know yeah like people are do it like, watching yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for visual representation <laughs> uh, and itch is something what is itching like for example yeah. when you are uh, when you got beaten by a mosquito it's like itching. Mm -hmm. I, I love those kind of expressions that are so graphic and what they yeah. describe um and you mentioned we had a student from Japan, I believe, who yeah. an, an older student, right? Who's like really representing a value that we have of, you know, always be learning, like be a lifelong mm -hmm. learner. Mm -hmm. There's even this quote mm -hmm. that I always like to, to reference that says, when you stop learning, you start dying. And like this guy is full out representing this. True, true. Hey, hello, Hirohisa. <laughs> <laughs> we are sending our greetings to you, to Japan. What... Um, amazes me about him and about the fluency circle is that uh there are people who like never stop learning and like you mentioned he's 74 years he's like a tireless learner himself he's a retired now and he decided to learn english um i believe if i remember well his daughter is married to an american they live in america um and he's learning english to be able to communicate with his grandchildren uh and he's so sweet and you know i learned so much from him although he is our student and he learns with us but um because he's so open and so curious um that's why i mentioned him yeah like he's really curious and it admire like it's so admirable that he doesn't stop learning yeah at his age and um, he learns about culture and he teaches us a lot. Like right now, I learned so many things about Japan. Just recently, he, uh, oh, he's like a huge fan of sending pictures. He's a good photographer. I think it was like his really, you know, hobby. Like he was almost- His passion, right? Photography, his passion, right? Mm -hmm. So he's sending his morning photos every day and like with a description. And just recently, maybe two days ago, he sent a short video with the sounds of cicada. And the picture of those holes where they uh, got out of after seven years of sleeping. And like, where else would I learn about that? You know, like, of course, these days you can find everything on the Internet, right? And I could possibly find that information if I wanted to. But you don't build relationships with the Internet, right? You build relationships with people. And I get to know about Japan through him through this student and it becomes like something personal when i think of japan now i'm I, i'm thinking about hirohisa and uh, i remember and i remember better what what i saw from his photos right and like yeah it's amazing <laughs> that's so true i think that's the really the magic of learning english is that it allows you to connect with people and cultures and all these things that maybe you'll never actually get the chance to travel there but I've had that same experience that I've connected with people, maybe going to language exchanges or going to, especially when I was a more active language learner myself, but meeting people from countries that I, I've never been to, I've never, you know, thought about going there, but I associate that country with that person and I'm able to like, learn things about that country with that person. And so then you get that curiosity. It's like, oh, maybe I would like to travel to that country someday, or maybe I would like to learn more about that culture. So I think that that's that's really great it uh also makes me think about one of the things that you mentioned here in this quote uh it's a really interesting term perspective seeking right like so he uh shows us this difference between uh, perspective taking and perspective seeking so there is mm -hmm. an english phrase like to take perspective is just like the same as this uh put yourself in someone else's shoes Mm -hmm. It's just to try to see a situation uh, from other person's angle, from their perspective, right? It's what to take perspective means. But what happens, as it explained in this quote, that we might simply guessing or making assumptions, and that could lead to misunderstanding. And perspective seeking, the, the verb seek means to search, to look for, right? So perspective seeking 
means to ask questions and uh, not draw conclusions, right? Not to make judgments, but to uh, make your judgments based on uh, some evidence, right? Uh, so by asking questions, by being curious, you will get those evidence. It almost sounds like a radical curiosity for things. Like uh, instead of making a judgment, always asking questions, always being, yeah, being being curious to understand. Like, oh, this person does things differently. Why? Instead of this person does things differently, that's wrong. You know, which tends to be people's mo. Like the their the way they usually operate is to automatically make a judgment that this person does things differently. Therefore, they are inferior, or they are confused, or they yeah, whatever the case is, right? Yeah. What is said also in this book, by the way, it's like Adam Grant says, don't believe uh, in what you think is true uh, because we, our beliefs may be false beliefs, mm -hmm. right? And it's always good to, you know, to doubt it and to seek for some evidence, seek for right. truth. Yeah, there was a quote I came across a few years ago that this really reminds me of that says, I don't even remember where I saw it, maybe in a book, but I never met a man so ignorant that he couldn't teach me something. And it, this really got me thinking because it's even if someone is, say they're, they're homeless or they're uneducated, they've never, they, they didn't graduate high school or something like this, that typically we would think that that person can't teach me anything, right? That person, they haven't completed a college degree or they haven't uh, been successful in their life. But it really gave me this perspective of humility that even someone who maybe I see isn't so successful or isn't so educated or whatever the case is, they're definitely going to know something that I don't know. Like even a homeless person has learned how to survive on the, on the streets, right? That's maybe a sign of success of some sort that maybe I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so successful at that. So true. <laughs> but, it's like, uh, how do you say that when you uh, learn not from books from the street, but from the street? Mm hmm yeah, we say like book knowledge or book smart or street smart. Oh, that's what I was looking yeah. for. Book, book smart and street smart. I like that expression. I want to share about my story. So um, I learned so much from this person, honestly. And um, he doesn't have a higher education. He started working uh, in his early uh, years, like I at the age of 14, I guess, because he comes from poor family. I was really um, amazed by how many simple things I learned from him. And I'm talking about my ex-husband. Uh, we were so different with him. He comes from Turkey originally, so he's a Muslim. And um, I think what stood out for me in him first is that exactly this uh, insatiable curiosity for people, for how people, we uh, met each other here in Ukraine. So he was so eager to learn about Ukraine, about our culture, uh, about our holidays, right? And um, what I remember is uh, once we had this conversation, could be there any issues with that, that I'm Christian, he's Muslim? And what he told me, just talk with me, he said that, um, and then he was referring to any religion at that time. And he believes that all oh, people who have this belief in some higher power, they most probably believe in some, uh, something like, you know, similar. There is one concept just of higher power. It's just like different people uh, have different paths to this higher power concept. And I like I couldn't believe that he, coming from you know a Muslim country, could have such thoughts that like it was like a Eureka moment for me then. Um, and then I no started noticing these um, small examples of daily curiosity <laughs> that he showed like in, for example, so, uh, I could never believe that he was uh, interested in joining me um, on Easter to go to the church to see how we celebrate Easter. And mm -hmm. we then found out that actually there are so many similarities 
it's just like they have another holiday. But <laughs> in those rituals and those what we do on that specific day, and yeah, those eggs and uh, Easter cake, actually it can be found in other holidays in Turkey. That is fascinating. Yeah, I had a similar experience actually that when I was coming up, uh, actually my parents are from different religions. My dad um, comes from a Jewish background. My mom comes from a Catholic background. And so I grew up with both. I grew up, you know, with both beliefs and traditions and rites of passage and so on. And I think that, you know, looking back on that, that probably actually also gave me a similar perspective that, okay, you know, it's all the same God. And I don't know, I don't want to offend anyone with that statement that's listening. Uh, but, you know, I think that's something that, that for me, at least having parents that were from two different religions and, you know, they were married and they could get along and, you know, they were both fine in embracing each other's traditions and whatnot. And then also, even when I got to high school, I got really curious about uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, about more Eastern philosophies and religions. And that really opened up my my mind too to you know what seems like a completely different way of doing thing but in the end they're all just things that are meant to guide us to being good people and to living a good life and so on so i think that ultimately as long as it doesn't harm anyone else you know i think it's it's all good stuff so or at least it's all just you know part of our, our own journey as you were saying and it also it, it not only enables you to stay open-minded and mm -hmm. tolerant and you know except that there may be more than only one right way to do things. And it helps you to build relationships with other people, right? Because you are more open. And that would be a great advice for parents out there. That's great to, uh, to really cultivate that open-mindedness. So, you know, we have like the Real Life English app. It makes it really easy for you all to connect to people or if you're connecting to people who are from different countries, different cultures, different religions, or anything else, it's always taking this, I mean, that's really what we want to impart onto you all is that it's really just taking this curious, humble mindset. Even if someone's a different religion from you, it doesn't mean you can't still be curious about how they do things, what they believe, their traditions and so on. Just like Kazenia was saying, her ex-husband, you know, he maybe he could have been really righteous in his beliefs and say, you know, I can't go to the church and learn about your Eastern traditions and everything, but he was open and curious. And it's like also Kazenia got to learn then about similar traditions that exist. And it's like in the end, uh, we, we really like to also talk about that um, this belief that no matter what divides us, that which unites us is far greater. That which, you know, the, the things that divide us as far as traditions, culture, religion, um, you know, where we, wherever we grew up in the world isn't as big as what unites us as humans. The things that we want the best for our children, we want to have success in our life, we want to connect with other people and so on, right? Yeah. I would also add here that try to treat those differences as just other ways to do things and be curious why it's different. And uh, for example, ask yourself a question, which also comes from this book. <laughs> what if I was born in that country? Mm -hmm. I would also have the same beliefs as this person, right? And what you just said, um, it also may be seen in the fluency circle, which we were talking about earlier, is that, for example, when I'm curious in something, how it's done in Italy, <laughs> we had mm -hmm. this funny discussion years ago about why you hate pineapple on pizza, right? <laughs> and we had Italians in the group to, you know, <laughs> um, discuss it with. <laughs> but if I'm, for example, interested in something particular about this country, I would go to the group, to the Fluency Circle, and I would ask Laurie from Germany about something German. Yeah. Uh, I would ask Stefania from Italy about Italy. So it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity to learn mm -hmm. about differences of other countries. But what I wanted to say is that when we discuss some universal things, like when we talk about music, hobbies, how we play with our kids, um, I don't know. Pizza anything, ingredients. Cooking. <laughs> Sorry? Pizza ingredients. <laughs> Pizza ingredients, <laughs> cooking, <laughs> boards, all right? Then we just don't pay attention. Is she from Italy or is he from Germany? We're just people and we discuss what we love, how we do things 
how to improve what we're doing, give some suggestions, ask for advice, and that's that's how it that how it would look like this world beyond borders you were talking about. That's so nice. Well, I want to make sure that we don't digress from, you know, taking the time to thank, to show appreciation to one of our listeners and viewers, podcast listeners, app users. So why don't we roll into today's shout out? So, and our shout out for today comes from Zakirullah. 692 and he writes i tried a lot to improve my listening speaking skills but found it quite hard luckily came across here found what i was looking for you gave us listening speaking and a basket of vocabulary at the same time <laughs> for which i'm very thankful to you and i would definitely invite all my friends here to this platform thank you Zakirullah. oh yeah thanks so much Zakirullah. Uh, probably butching your name there. I'm very sorry for that, <laughs> but thanks so much for taking the time to leave us a nice comment there. Uh, they left a comment over on YouTube. So if you want us to shout you out, just let us know what you're thinking about the podcast. It could be on YouTube. It could be by leaving us a five-star review in your favorite podcast, listening, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else, or by leaving us a five-star review for the app in your favorite app store. That said, let's learn all of the fantastic vocabulary from today's quote. One of the first really interesting expressions here, Ksenia, is he says, putting ourselves in another person's shoes enables us to walk in lockstep with them. So what does it mean to walk in lockstep with someone? So I don't think it's a very common phrase to use because it's a military term. But if mm -hmm. you imagine soldiers marching, so they do it in lockstep, so one by one, one after the other. Yeah, it's like they're synchronized, right? And they're walking, so no one's stepping on each other's shoes. They all keep the same exact pace and so on. It requires a lot of discipline and training, actually. Uh, and maybe a more common, you mentioned like this one's not very common. That's right. Uh, I typically wouldn't use this, but we might use more commonly uh, walk a mile in someone's shoes or just simply you know, put yourself in someone's shoes or walk in someone's shoes. But very often in the full phrase, walk a mile in someone's shoes explains a similar thing of really putting yourself in their perspective. All right, next, it mentioned that we're terrible mind readers. So true. What does it mean if you are a mind reader or you read someone's mind? Yeah, I think I heard read someone's mind more often, but I really like how he put it here like this. I like English for that. You can play with words. <laughs> so, That's very true. Uh, mind reader is a person who would probably could read your thoughts, could look into your face, <laughs> look into your eyes and say what you're thinking of right now at this moment. Mm -hmm. Mind readers are people who can tell uh, your thoughts. We might also call this like a psychic, right? Or a fortune teller, someone who has otherworldly abilities to be able to know what's going on in your head, which most of us do not have those otherworldly abilities. We're not able to read anyone's mind. You might hear this a lot, for example, in a relationship that if you're, maybe you're fighting with your partner and because they're mad that they assumed that you understood something, but you didn't, you might say, well, I can't read your mind or I'm not a mind reader. You have to tell me. I can relate. By the way, <laughs> Ethan. <laughs> Are you a good mind reader? I'm not. I'm a terrible mind reader. <laughs> not one of my skills. All right. And next, he mentions that we can't have a eureka moment by imagining his perspective. This is a really nice word, eureka. So what's a eureka mm -hmm, moment? Mm -hmm. So nice. Beautiful word. Yeah, it's a eureka <laughs> moment. Like even I like how it, how I spell it, how it's pronounced, how it sounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, the eureka moment is the same as aha uh -huh moment is something like a sudden realization. Mm -hmm. Like I heard you use this phrase a lot. It dawned on me. Yes. Yeah, so mm. It's another way to say yeah. that. It's like I realized I suddenly understood this. There's a more formal term for this too that we call an epiphany. So you could say you have an epiphany. All of a sudden you realize something. And as you said, aha uh, uh -huh moment. Eureka also, it's an interesting word because people might say this i probably wouldn't actually say this nowadays but i've seen people use this that all of a sudden they have one of these realizations like a scientist that's been experimenting for a long time and then finally they find the solution they might say eureka like come on to the solution 
Yeah, I think it's like a very popular with those Newton meme when Apple mm. falls on, it, on his head and, mm -hmm. and it's written like Eureka. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, so he talks about how actually talking to people to gain insight into the nuances of their views. What does it mean if you gain an insight about something? I believe to gain insight means to, again, it comes back to understanding, realization, to gain insight is maybe to um, figure out uh, about, yeah, figure out something, get mm -hmm. insights. It's like mm, gain is to get something, yeah, to obtain something and insight, uh, sight, we hear here the um, word sight related to vision, some, right? Mm -hmm. So insight is like the meaning of something maybe and he also mentions their nuances so i'd like to think of it's a really nice word as well like this is again why reading books is, is a great way to learn english because we tend to use very beautiful figurative language that we might not use all the time in our speaking although sometimes you can if you're wanting to give a, a touch of formality or a touch of poeticness to your speech but nuances is subtle details or differences so you might say the nuances between two similar cultures, meaning the, the subtleties that only someone maybe who has lived there might really notice these things. Next, he talks about instead of drawing conclusions about people based on minimal clues. So what does it mean if you draw a conclusion about something or someone? Okay, draw is an interesting verb. It has so many different meanings. Here in this phrase, to draw conclusions is... Um, it means to make, again, to make judgments, maybe, mm -hmm. to come to some uh, idea based on your assumptions. Uh, to draw conclusions is just to draw. It's just to, to take something, right? To take away or to withdraw also. To so draw conclusions is you have something and based on that, you make your judgment. There's a phrase we might, if someone was doing this, maybe they're drawing conclusions too quickly without enough evidence, we might use another really nice expression, which is don't judge a book by its cover, which you can actually imagine what that means, that if someone saw a book and the cover of it just looks very boring or it's ugly or it's decayed or something like that, it's old, and they think, oh, I don't want to read that. It's probably no good based on the cover. But maybe it's a, a wonderful book. Maybe it's a beautiful book. Maybe it has some, some really rich lessons or some insights that you could gain right so we use this for many other things you know maybe if you're saying oh i don't want to go to travel to germany german seems so so mean right it's like well don't judge a book by its cover you should go there and actually talk to some germans and actually see for yourself what they're like um no i, I lived in germany and i love germans and everything so <laughs> i was just picking that out as a random example i definitely do not think germans are mean yeah you can also by the way say to jump to conclusions so don't jam mm don't jump to conclusions too fast that's a great one yeah and he said based on minimal clues so you're you're drawing conclusions about people based on minimal clues what is a clue maybe people have pay, play this uh mm -hmm. board game but maybe it might have a different name in their native language it was one i really liked yeah. when i was a kid called clue yeah <laughs> i think i i heard about this game but um yeah so i when explaining the phrase draw conclusions i use the word evidence so evidence is another way to say clue. Mm -hmm. Clue is such a funnier word, right? <laughs> <laughs> than evidence. Evidence, it sounds like scientific, formal a little bit, but clue mm -hmm. is exactly like it reminds you of a game. Right. Clues and uh, you, 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 you collect those clues to figure out. And, yeah. Or like Sherlock Holmes, when he's on a mystery, he's trying to gather different clues to help him solve the mystery. And we could also use this more informally to say like, oh, I'll, I'll clue you in. So if you're feeling lost about something, I can say, Ksenia, I'll clue you in. I'm gonna give you some more information so you, you know what we're talking about. Uh, and then finally, I really like this expression. They test their hypotheses by striking up conversations. Actually there too, this word, because there's hypothesis and hypotheses. It's a strange word because the formal, sorry, the plural, is made um, by changing it from an I, an I hypothesis to an E. So you don't add an S at the end or anything because it already has an S, but the sound does change. Hypothesis is singular and hypotheses 
is plural. And there's other ones like this. I don't think I'm going to be able to think of one off the top of my head, but I thought that'd be interesting to point out. I think it's uh, uh, it relates to those Latin words, right? And mm -hmm. recently I've read the article. It uh, was about exactly those plural uh, forms of those Latin words. And mm. right now, English speaking community rethink is rethinking <laughs> their way of forming those plurals because, uh, for example, like the word cactus and cacti, mm -hmm. fungi and fungi, how is fungus it? and fungi, Fung fungi, right? Fungus <laughs> and fungi. Uh, so it's pretty acceptable right now to say cactuses and fungus. Funguses. Like that's, that. that's a yeah. hard one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Or if there's people too who say fishes. It should be one fish, many fish. It's one of those ones that doesn't change it, but there are people who say fishes. But I don't know. I, I personally, probably because I'm an English teacher too, but I really like the cactus, cacti, and the fungus, fungi sort of thing because it's, it's uni it adds more of a uniqueness to that word, right? That it has a, an abnormal plural. But I want to highlight here too, this is our final expression, to strike up conversations. I love this collocation. So what does it mean to strike up a conversation? Yeah, so conversations, we are having today a wonderful conversation with you, Ethan. Uh, to strike up a conversation just simply means to start a conversation. Yep, so um, you can think of the verb to strike as to hit something, right? But the phrasal verb strike up actually means to start something. Strike up a conversation means to start a conversation. I don't know if it has any connection, but what I always think of with this collocation is, I, I don't know if you would be familiar with this collocation. I grew up with a fireplace. So I remember having these matches that you had to strike on the side of the box so that they, the, they would, you know, come, uh, they, they would light, they would come aflame. And so what I think about it a little bit like that, there's like a, a chemical reaction happening there, right? It goes from being just a stick to being something that's with a with fire. And I think of that as a little bit in this context that it's like you meet someone and it's like all of a sudden a flame occurs, you know, as you're having a, a good chemistry, you're having a connection, right? You've struck up a conversation. I believe there's not many uh, contexts where we use this uh, as far as like strike up with something else. But I know you can also say to strike up a friendship. It's, it's might also, we might use that like in the context that, for example, you meet someone and there's just automatically that chemistry that you connect which that's pretty rare, right? To have that. But when it does happen, it's like, you know, you want to hold on, right? So, because it's, it's something really special has happened there. So we might say, you know, you struck up a friendship with that person. It was just something that happened really quick. There was a great connection. You clicked. You clicked. So that's another really great one. All right, Ksenia, if you're ready, now it's time for today's big challenge. Okay, and the big challenge today is what's a book or quote that has been impactful on your life and values? We'd love to hear it. Leave us a comment on YouTube or send us an email at hello at reallifeglobal.com. If you prefer, you can also record your voice message of yourself reading it. You can send your voice message at pickpipe.com slash English. Also linked in the description. Keep it short, 30 seconds or less. We really appreciate it. And before we go, we want to make sure to thank some of you that participated in another one of our recent big challenges. Okay, so in uh, the episode number 346, Tiago and Kase asked you to create a story with the words geometry, performance, and thanks. So Nafis Anur sent us this short story of his. Yesterday, my friend suddenly messaged me saying, we have a geometry class in 10 minutes. When I was getting ready to go to see the performance of my cousin singing, thanks to her, I had attended the class before going out. The next one comes from Marlon Lobo. I was in my geometry class when I listened in the corridor of the school the word thanks loudly. I was very curious at that time because I have been in math class and I hate it. I came to check it out and it was a student's presentation which caught up my attention. It was an amazing performance of those students. Nice. So thank you so much guys for your beautiful stories. We enjoyed reading them. 
So if you're enjoying this podcast or video podcast and you would like a free way to support us, it's really simple. You can leave us a five-star review in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube. So like I said, both of these are free ways for you to help us to get the word out to more learners so we can help so many more people to become global citizens and to become confident natural English speakers, just like hopefully we're helping you to do with this podcast. And before we sign out, remember that no matter what divides us, that which unites us is far greater. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, native speakers, they speak too fast. What they don't realize many times is that it's not so much about the speed per se, but native speakers tend to speak in a connected way. So we are going to be teaching you in today's lesson some of the main connected speech patterns that we see in English. It allows you then to embrace that curiosity of when you're watching something, listening to a podcast, anything else, of looking out for when you notice these. Also, to be able to decipher when you hear something that you have no idea what that was, you might be able to figure out that there's actually some connected speech happening there and figure out what it means.